Welcome to this soul lifting broadcast, which has been put together for your spiritual growth and to make greatness common right where you are. Be sure to make the best of this moment as God takes the lead in all that concerns you. Let's start out in the scriptures this morning. I'm teaching on what I've titled Breaking Free from Offense. Breaking Free from Offense. The series is just a two part series, uh, just for two Sundays, which we titled Exhale. Uh, breathe and breathe out all kinds of offense and the things that hold us back. When the devil wants to get a believer and he knows that you, uh, the blood that was shed for you was not fake, it was real, that the covenant that we have with God stops the end of our adversary from touching us, then it, it throws in some kind of bait. One of the baits of Satan is offense. Offense opens the door for affliction in the life of the offended. Offense, I say it again, opens the door for affliction in the life of the offended. The offended may suffer heel health just because you are offended. Somebody who is offended, your blood pressure can start to go up. This is just physiology, your, your body composition I'm talking about right now. And when, it, when you refuse to deal with that offense, you stay in a perpetual state of ill health. Some people's ill health has been traced to just the offense they carry in them. And it can go to any length when you keep the offense there. Because the offense will open the door to the devil to afflict anyone. Offense is the bait of Satan. Satan uses it to get us, knowing that Christ has paid the price for us, and ordinarily, he shouldn't be able to touch us. But when we open the door to him, by remaining offended, by allowing him, uh, or allowing offense to fester in our heart, then the door is open. The door is open. It affects our attitude towards the one who offended us and towards every other human being that, look, that, may, you know, that, that, that looks like uh, maybe they may also have the, the propensity to offend us. We start to shut the door on people. We become very deliberate about how we shut people out of our lives. Offense can lead you into loneliness and isolation. And the more isolated you are, the more vulnerable you are to attacks from the devil. That's what most people don't understand. When you're offended once, you see 10 people and you feel that all of them will offend you, maybe apart from one. So you deal with just 10% of all the people around you. And before you know it, gradually, you're withdrawing into your shell. And the devil is, he, he will keep targeting you. Because when you're isolated from the pack, then you're hoping to much more attack. Is somebody still here this morning? And Jesus... And the great apostle Paul made mention of how the end times is going to look like. Let me start out this morning by just uh, showing that uh, as we go further in this age, because these are the end times, the, 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 the room for offense will become larger. Will become larger. It will become larger. When they asked Jesus what are the signs of the end times, in Matthew 24, can you put up verse 9 and 10 for me of Matthew 24? Uh, one of the things that Jesus said about the, 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 the end times, what, what will characterize the end time, offense, betrayal, and all that are very you know, strong in some of the things that he, he mentioned. Praise God. In, in verse 9, they said, then they will deliver you up for, uh, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Look at verse 10. And then many will be offended. Will betray one another and will hate one another. And now it's not talking about people outside of the church. It's even talking about people within the church, people outside of the church. Have you noticed that as we progress in these end times, we've noticed, for instance, that divorce rate has gone up both within and outside the church. The church has not been insulated from that. Divorce rate has gone up. People's tolerance for other people's weakness has greatly reduced. It's part of the signs of the end times according to Jesus. People's tolerance for other people's weaknesses have greatly reduced. Said so that they, 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 many will be offended. Can you put, that, put back the scripture, please? Pull, pull it back. Yeah. Many will be offended. Many will, you know, you, you said will be betrayed. Will betray one another. Will hate one another. And in verse 11 of Matthew 24, he said that many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Are, are we not seeing all these things today? Yeah. False prophets all over the place. Hooligans, you know, on, on the pulpit. People who just, you know, deceive people either to collect their money or to, 
you know, to, to just do all kinds of things. And he said, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The love of many will grow cold. We see the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, when you read from verse uh, 1 to 5, give me that in, 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 in the New Living Translation. 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5. You see the same thing. Paul was writing to Timothy. This time Paul was about rounding off his ministry. He has become an old man who was about to go. He said in, in 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3 from verse 1, he said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Look at verse 2. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. This is what is happening in this age. Am I saying the truth? Yeah, people talk about church, talk about men of God, talk about anyhow. They have no regard for anybody. They will consider nothing sacred. These are signs of the end times. No regard for parents or parental figures or pa your parents' age mates. <laughs> there will be no regard. Ungrateful. They consider nothing sacred. Boastful, proud, scoffing at God. Many people have refused to come to church again, just scoffing at God. And when you ask them, they say, oh, the pastors are... They're, 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 they're thieves. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about your friends. <laughs> I have some friends who are behaving like that, too. Yeah. I have people I've been calling since January that I haven't seen in church in January. I've been calling them. Where are you? And when I asked another friend, he said, uh, he said, all oh, the churches are the same. Yeah. They are offended at God, at the church. The same spirit of offense is going through the environment. Yeah. The same people are offended at business partners, offended at all kinds of people, offended at their spouses, at family members. The spirit of offense abounds everywhere. It's a part of the signs of the end time. Look at verse 3. He said they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and eat what is good. Look at verse 4. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride. It looks like what Jesus said in Matthew 24, if you still remember what we just read. And love pleasure rather than God. Look at the final one, verse 5. He said they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. This was Paul writing to his protege, Timothy, and saying this is how you live your life. We, can, we, we need to keep encouraging people who are in full-blown, who are under the full-blown attack of the spirit of the end times, but we shouldn't allow what has, you know, infected them to infect us. And the only way we'll do that is that we'll refuse to make our love to wax cold. In the scriptures, the two words used for love predominantly in the New Testament. One is filio, the other one is agape. There are many other words, but those two are very predominantly used. Filio and agape in the Greek. Filio is a love of friendship. Just, you know, love of friendship. You rub my back, I rub your back. We're just good with each other and we help each other. Agape is the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, which has nothing to do with you rub my back, I rub your back. Even if, I, even if I don't have back, I will still rub your back. Yeah. If I don't have any back, I will still rub your back. That's the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And when, in, in both Matthew 24 and 2 Timothy chapter 3, when the scripture says the love of many will wax cold, it was talking about agape. The love of God that is, that is you know, unconditional will start to wax cold. Many who will be betrayed, many will behave in ways that you cannot believe. Luke 17 and verse 1, Jesus warned us, he said, it is impossible, but that offense will come. Offense will come. He only said, woe unto him, through whom offense will come. So I'm saying all this for us to understand that the time and age that we live in is a time where offenses will be pervasive. Yeah, offenses will be pervasive. I've settled all kinds of issues in this church. There was a time my wife and I were just praying against the spirit of offense every day, every day. 
It's like a cloud. We're just pushing it back. This thing must not rest here. Because the easiest thing to find is people fighting each other. And then talking to other people, talking to people within family or not, I realize that it's not just our church. People have just become fighters. <laughs> and it's the spirit of the end time. And then I started to study the scriptures and saw that Jesus talked about this thing. These are the end times. Paul, written, writing to Timothy, mentioned this thing vehemently. He said, Timothy, look out for this in the end times. These are the things that will happen. As a relationship coach, I realized that people have become very intolerant. The easiest thing to do now is for somebody to want, to want out of a marriage, to just walk out. Very intolerant. The spirit of discouragement is so strong now when it comes to people staying together. Breaking business partnerships anyhow, just behaving, you know, long-term friends just working out on each other. Becoming extremely pervasive because of the spirit of the end time. But we need to break free from offense because if you can handle offenses, because offenses will abound, we need to, you know, to gain understanding of the word of God on how to handle offenses because we live in a time where offenses will abound. There's nothing you can do about it. Before this week is over, I promise somebody here, somebody will offend you. <laughs> it's not about, you know, escaping offense. It's about how do I undo offense to the point that the devil will not take advantage of me and I will not miss my path in destiny. I will not be derailed because of offense. Praise God. Tell your neighbor, beware of offense. Glory be to Jesus. Now, let's, let's, let's quickly look at breaking free from offense. Matthew 18, when you read from verse 15 to 17, the scripture says here about, okay, let, let, let me read. It said, if your brother sinned against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, Take one or two other along with you. That every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to you, to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So what's this scripture saying? That as a process to managing offenses. And when you are offended as a believer, there's a posture to take. That posture is a posture of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Agape love. And that's what should motivate you to want to reach out to the person. And not just to cut off. Just reach out to the person. And he says, if the person is not listening to you, call one or two people who can talk to him. If you have the same household of faith, local church, then try to report the case to the leaders or elders of the church. Let them reach out in between both of you. If it's within family, call the leaders of the family in the same vein. Talk to them so that they can talk to both of you. This, as a Christian, you know, process and precepts that we have on how to handle offense between you and somebody that you know and that you have a relationship with. So, many people, when they are offended, focus on what? The word that starts with R. I can't hear you. Oh, say, 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 say to your neighbor. <laughs> and in these days where there are many movies around Avengers, <laughs> and, uh, you know, in the last three years or so, a lot has come out. Uh, stories about, you know, people fighting other people's battles. So what some people do now is to just form a Avengers group. Just call like two or three people. And say, let's mark that guy. We're not giving him business again. We're Avengers. We are bent for our friend. That's what people do most of the time. Even within the church. Within a unit, somebody offends somebody. The person goes and starts to talk about that offender to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people. What is the person doing? The person is trying to win some level of sentiment or sympathy. Yeah. 
distributing some sentimental thought to win the sympathy of the other people so that you look like the victim and other people can gang around you to then deal with that person. And most of the time, a lot of us make mistakes of not even talking to the other person at all. The avenging spirit just comes upon us. And we just see ourselves as the avenger of the, my friend's destiny. So you see the other person maybe at work or in church the next, the, the next time. You even greet them. Ah, sister, what happened? Ah, you're not even greeting me. For what? <laughs> yeah. In your heart, you're thinking, why, why should I be greeting you? You, this bad person that did this to this person. But yet you are not saying anything. You're not talking to the person about it. You're not saying anything at all. You just assume the position of the avenger. A lot of the time, when we're offended, the only important thing on our mind is how we will revenge. Or how we'll be, you know, how... So we pursue revenge to the detriment of our lives. And the truth is that pursuing revenge will most likely cause more harm than good. That's what most people don't understand. Rather than letting go and following the scriptural uh, uh, precept, we want to pursue revenge. But it doesn't yield the right fruit. In Romans 12, verse 19, 20, and 21, we'll read that. God postured himself as the best avenger. The best avenger. Look at this. Romans 12 and verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's what the scripture says. God says, vengeance is mine. I am your avenger. I am your avenger. Just, just let me handle it. God is the best avenger. God is the best avenger. God says he will avenge. He knows how best to do it. Much more than what you can be thinking about. Sometimes you just think, let him just sack the person. If it's office, the office situation. Yeah. Meanwhile, what God has in mind to avenge you is to give you a better job somewhere else. While you focus on this person must lose this job and you start to scheme, talk to people, distribute the hurt, and the pain in your heart within the hierarchy of your organization just because somebody has offended you and hurt you badly. You are not even looking at the opportunities. You know, there's a, play, a place a man can be, a woman can be, the opportunities will not be able to see you and you will not be able to see opportunities because of the load of offense that is in your heart. So instead of, you know, positioning for the next opportunity that God wants to bring into your life to bring you out of this cycle of offense, you are busy distributing odds and distributing offense, distributing, you know, hatred and negative vibes all over the organization. Even the things that God wants to do in your life, you are oblivious of it. Because the devil got you down with offense. Can somebody say here, it's important that we recognize that God is the best avenger. Sometimes we often wish that the offender will die. Or experience pain. But God has a more redemptive plan. God's plan to revenge for you is redemptive, it's not destructive. Some of us are never happy when the people who offended us are doing well. Yeah. In fact, that's when you get angry with God. Like, how can somebody be doing this kind of evil at me and he's still getting promoted? As far as you are concerned, he should die. That's where, like, the, you know, uh, the kind of prayers that tend to want to kill enemies, that's where it comes from. Yeah. Our number one enemy is the devil, and he's not going to die. So what are you doing? <laughs> Have you thought about it? Yeah. Satan is a spirit. You can't kill spirit. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the number one enemy, the one who causes all the problems. So when you feel, finish killing all human beings, <laughs> Satan is still alive. He will still find other available vessels. Because that's his own job. He doesn't have any other job. 
I'm just saying it in plain language so that you understand. So that you focus on yourself and refuse you know, to focus on... No, nobody can hurt you when you are under the mighty hand, the everlasting hand of Jehovah. Yeah. So why don't you focus on how you're going to maintain your position under, that, under his everlasting hands without offense in your heart because your offense takes you out of that positioning. Yeah. It takes humility. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and they are saved. That's what the scripture says. But it takes humility to run in that direction. Most people, when they are offended, they run in a different direction. And they're asking, who will avenge for me? Who will avenge for me? And God says, I'm your avenger. But because he will not do it quickly, or he will not do it the way you want him to do it, yeah, God does not use rat poison. Let me just say the truth. Yeah. Because some people, they will better, I mean, in the way the thing is happening in your heart, and staring your heart right now, you just go and buy rat poison, I give it to God. God, use this one. Yeah. <laughs> As if he doesn't know what to do. Say, so use, use, use. You can use this, it's faster. Use this one. That's the way the, some people's mind is working right now. Yeah. So for you to just wake up after boiling overnight and the following morning, you went on Instagram and you saw the person posted a picture with her husband and they're smiling. He said, See my boo. <laughs> and then your head will just fly off the handle again to say, Ah, God! <laughs> What's happening here? <laughs> Praise God. Uh, I know God is healing somebody here this morning. God is healing somebody who is watching this online. In the precious name of Jesus. I want you to say after me, say in the name of Jesus, I'm delivered from offense. Say I walk free from offense. Say the love of Jesus is in my heart. My heart is large enough to contain the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Say this morning, I yield my heart to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, let the love of Jesus flow freely in my heart. Give me grace to walk free of offenses in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, believe in amen. amen. Praise God. Somebody getting blessed this morning. God's judgment is born out of love, not malice. We need to understand that. God disciplines, but it's not hateful. God does not participate in vengeance born of anger. He doesn't. He doesn't participate in that kind of vengeance. So the big question this morning, do you want to feel better or do you want your life <laughs> to be better? You know what revenge does to us? It makes us feel better, but it doesn't mean that our life will become better. Okay, many of us have watched this on TV before. At least if it has not happened on your street, you must have seen it on TV. Where a lady has been cheated on. And then the guy that is cheating parked his car in front of the, the new babe's house. And the lady will find, you know, like a, um, golf clubs or baseball bat or whatever and just go there. Why? Why? And just breaks everything. Yeah. And then as it's breaking it, the, the car alarm will go off, you know, and all that. And then before you know it, police will come. And then they will hold her and take her away. Yeah. As she's going, she'll be feeling like, yes, I dealt with him. Yeah. But by the time they will find her, especially if it's abroad, you know here, you can almost bab your way through it out, out of anything. Yeah. But if it's abroad, by the time they give you how much you pay, and then they'll tell the person maybe you should go and serve punishment, do community service, or spend uh, six months in jail, or something ridiculous like that. Then after a while, you sit down, and then the devil will start to deal with the person. To so see your life. <laughs> see your life. Even the car that you destroyed, insurance has returned it. Another car. Yeah. And the guy and the new babe are driving this, in the car now. <laughs> and they're still posting it on Instagram. To shame the devil that is moving you. Yeah. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying this morning. See, there are 
feelings that move us to say the wrong things, do the wrong things. We feel we're going to feel better after doing those things. But we need to make up our mind, do I want to feel better or do I want to live better? Do I want to feel better only or do I want my life to go forward? Because you can feel better and your life may be going backwards just because you are mismanaging the offense. Glory be to Jesus. Contrary to popular belief, watching your enemies suffer will not give peace. Yeah. Watching your enemies suffer will not give you peace. It will not give you peace. Yeah. Watching your enemies suffer does not mean that you are going to be promoted in the office. Yeah. Watching your enemies suffer, maybe because it's a marital situation, does not mean that you are going to get married immediately. Why don't we focus on what will move our life forward and leave the enemy behind? Are you still with me today? Yeah. And allow God to be God in the affairs of our lives. Human vengeance does not guarantee progress. <laughs> yeah. Human vengeance does not guarantee progress. That you avenge yourself does not mean your life is going to go forward. James chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Yeah, James 1 and verse 20, the wrath of man will not produce the righteousness of God. I want you to let me tell your neighbor this morning, say it's time to move forward. It's time to let go of offense. It's time to move forward. It's also important to know that forgiveness isn't weakness and malice isn't strength. So if there's somebody here in this service this morning, you are a world champion in malice. You can represent Lagos State. If there's any, <laughs> any championship in malice, there are people you have not spoken to since this time last year. Yeah. And the only reason is because there's something, there's kind of bitterness in your heart about them. There are people who live in the same house, husband and wife, and they're counting weeks. There are 52 weeks in a year. Yeah. Who will surpass each other? The last time we had a quarrel, you did six weeks. I will show you with eight weeks. <laughs> so that you will know that you don't have the exclusive preserve of capacity for malice. I'm better than you. That's how some people behave. I'm just trying to make this very practical this morning. Yeah, that's how some people behave. And then you, you just take that malice. Forgiveness isn't weakness. Malice isn't strength. The fact that you forgive so easily and so quickly, which is the mind of God, the will of God for you, does not make, mean you're a weak person. Yeah. Forgiveness should come quickly. That's the will of God for us. That's the will of God for us. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 4 and verse 26, it said, be hungry, but sin not, and let not the sun go down on your anger. That means the total sum of the time for your anger should be something around 12 to 24 hours. Yeah. So it says, forgive quickly, and let go of negative vibes quickly, so that it does not become habitual in your life. Some of us can stay with negative vibes. We can deal with it. We can keep it. You can come back from work, go straight to the living room, watch TV, go to bed. Every, the other person in the house is just another piece of furniture. Yeah. And you're just doing your own thing. For some people, the easiest thing for you is to walk out on people's lives. Just walk out of people's lives. Forgiveness isn't weakness, malice isn't strength. If that's the only thing you, you take out of this service this morning, please take it very well. Put it in a corner of your heart. Forgiveness isn't weakness, and malice is not strength. This is kingdom talk. This is not worldly talk. This is kingdom talk. This is kingdom principle. Forgiveness is not weakness, and malice is not strength. Let's quickly talk about the offender. The offender. Many people are listening to me this morning. Many people will be a part of this uh, you know, message somehow uh, you know, in, in, on TV and whatever. If you are the offender, in Luke 17 and verse 1, Jesus said, Woe unto him through whom offense will come. 
We have to be careful how we present ourselves. We have to be careful how we position ourselves uh, so that we are not the object of offense perpetually. It's not a good place to be. Somebody may be listening to me this morning. You, you, are, you, you don't feel any offense in your heart towards anybody, but many people are, like we say in this current terminology, beefing you. Yeah. Many people are not in good terms with you. You are okay. You're smiling. You know. You are getting all the contracts. And it's because you have caught some people. You caught them. You know. You've done funny stuff. That's what I'm saying. You've offended people. It may even be a simpler situation than that. Family situation. You've just robbed people off wrongly. You, 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 you don't feel for people. You lack capacity for empathy. You behave as if other people don't exist. Or maybe because your life is working well right now. It's important for us to know that we must never position ourselves as objects of offense. In Matthew 5, when you read verse 23 and 24, the Bible says in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way first to be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. God says, I need your heart to be right more than I need your gift at the altar. I need you to be more sensitive to the people around you more than I need your gift at the altar. Many people, you see, there's an interference between African traditional religion and how we receive Christianity in Africa. In African traditional religion, if you appease the gods, it doesn't matter. Just kill one dog or goat and put the, the blood uh, in the, at the roundabout. Something like that. You know, you, you've all watched it in our movies before. You understand? Don't behave as if you're not Nigerians. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You just do something like that, and then whether you are living right or not, the God are okay with you. Yeah. And we, that mindset has crept in into the way we practice our Christianity in Africa. We are more concerned about the gift that we give to God to the detriment of the state of our hearts. It's nice to honor God with your substance, but God is more interested in your heart than your substance. Yeah. God is more interested in your heart than your substance. That's why I said when you bring a gift to the altar, don't behave like God is not the God of your village. Yeah, all those strange gods and wicked gods that we have <laughs> in Africa, that all they want is just your material thing. They don't mind if you're a wicked person. Just sacrifice. <laughs> Am I saying the truth? Yeah, just sacrifice. If you sacrifice, you'll be okay. And God says, no, 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 no. Jesus said, no. If you bring your gift to the altar and you know someone has something against you, he said, go and reconcile with him, first and foremost. First and foremost, go and reconcile with that person. Go and reconcile. Your non-repentance is an affront on God. And God says, I won't hear your prayer if you refuse to forgive other people. If you are, like I said, the one who has offended somebody, who is the object of offense, you need to think about it very well. And, you know, think about it from the golden rule perspective. Do unto others how you want them to do unto you. We will reduce the spate of offense if we will not regularly position as the object of offense. So how would you feel if you were treated how you treat people? How would you feel if people speak to you the way you speak to other people? Because a lot of offense comes from just how people behave, how people talk, how we, we behave around other people. That's where offense comes from most of the time. Yeah. What we say about people, how we behave to people, how we care or how we refuse to care. In a church setting like this, a lot of offense will come from that. In a work environment, a lot of offense will come from that. Before you send an email to somebody, read it three times. And just reverse it in your mind. If somebody sent me this kind of email, will I be happy going home? Yeah. 
And I'll be happy going home. Every time I have the opportunity to talk to the people who work with me, even when I'm angry, I try to not to say you know, something that I will regret. And if I don't feel comfortable about what I've said, I call the person later and say, if, you, if I said something that is not very okay, I'm, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. I've apologized to my PA before. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. He's sitting down here. I said, just called him after, I mean, after a few hours. I said, ah, the way I spoke that time, I'm not sure it was very okay. I apologize. This is the matter we're dealing with. Let's focus on the matter. Yeah. I don't want to disrespect you. Yeah. The position that I, have, that I hold as lead pastor is just a privileged position. There's nothing different between me and every other person. Yeah. So if you are the business owner who feels like the king of your village, and you open your mouth and talk to people anyhow, you are becoming the object of offense. You tell people, do, do you have brain? Do you have brain? Is your brain still working? You know some people, some people, you know how humiliating it is for somebody to call you and say, um, which school did you go to? <laughs> and then you're, you're not sure whether to answer or not. <laughs> Those are things that people will never forget in their life. Now, to the person who's offended, I'm saying it to you today. Can you forgive what you can't forget? Yeah. Because God wants us to forgive things even if we feel we can never forget them. It's not about forgetting them. It's about, you know, forgiving them. Yeah. That's the problem most of us have. We think we have to forget it. We have to feel better about it before we can forgive it. God said, forgive first. Leave me to work on you to feel better and to forget it. Because forgetting it may take a long time. Yeah. A long time. Do you know the amount of time between when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery and the time they showed up? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the one that is the object of offense, the one who caused the offense, is easy to forget. The brothers could not recognize Joseph. Uh, but Joseph recognized them like this. Yeah once. Because he has forgiven, but he did not forget. Yeah. So why do we think that we have to forget before we forgive? Or we have to feel better? And Joseph confirmed that these were his brothers. He went into one corner and just cried. Just to, just to release the last bit of everything that is still there and everything. Just let it go. Can you tell your neighbor it's okay to cry? Yeah. Just cry once and just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. That was what Joseph did. Just cried. Just allowed it, this negative vibe to go. And then renewed himself in the love of God as in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And you know what he said to them? You sued me, but God sent me. <laughs> God sent me. It's a matter of perspective. His perspective changed about the situation. He said, you sold me, but God sent me. God sent me. Even the psalmist in Psalm 105, when you read verse 16 and 17, Psalm 105, 16 and 17, look at the way the psalmist put it. He says, moreover, God called for famine in the land. He says, moreover, God called for famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. But look at what he said, verse 17. He sent a man before them, Joseph who was sold as a slave. See, the selling as a slave, which is an offensive action, God used it as the DHL path, as the... <laughs> because here, the, psalmist, the Bible did not record it as if his brothers offended him. He said, God sent him. He sent him ahead. Sometimes the offense is to project you into your, your destiny. Yeah. You can imagine if Joseph held that thing tightly. That's why I'm saying this morning, get, you know, release yourself from offense. Release yourself from offense. God has a bigger plan 
for you than what anybody can have for you. And their action can be turned around. I speak to a woman here this morning. The action of your husband sometimes is God just sending you and creating a path for you to fulfill your destiny. Don't hold that thing tightly in your heart. Don't hold that thing tightly in your heart. If you are the one that has caused the offense, don't just dust yourself and say it doesn't matter and keep going. No. No. Repent. Lastly this morning, lastly this morning, I need to say this and then we'll pray. Your non-repentance and in front of God, like I said before, because you need to mark how you feel if somebody should do that for, to you. So for the person who is the object of offense, apologize and make amends. Apologize and make amends. This is the equation that I want to end with. Repentance plus apology is what equals reconciliation. We've made many mistakes in the body of Christ to think that forgiveness equals reconciliation. No. I'm not stupid. You can't hurt me so badly and then I'm coming back to you. No. I forgive you from a distance. I still have my brain. Yeah. Is, is it until you kill me? <laughs> for, for there to be reconciliation, there has to be repentance and there has to be apology. In 1 John 1, 9, the Bible says that uh, uh, God himself demands the same thing from us. Yeah. Can you, can, he said, if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But he said, what if we confess? We confess our sins. We confess our sins. Yeah. It's faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. We have to say it. We have to confess our sins. That's what the scripture says there. Yeah. So it's the same thing. You, you, you have wronged somebody. Speak to them. Show repentance. If you were prone to anger, and you are losing control of yourself until you punch somebody in the face and the person moves out of the house and being practical. Next month, we're going to get into this deeply as we go into the Better Half series. And the person moves out of the house. Don't come and beg us for the person to just come back. What are you doing about anger management? Yeah. Because you have to do something about anger management. That's what shows repentance. Repentance is an action. That I'm turning, yeah, in a different direction. And I'm receiving help. You cannot steal my money and still be, believe that I will keep you in the same business. We may be brothers in the same church, even from the same family. We we'll fire you first. Yeah. And then we want to see that you have become better. That's when we can put money around you again. <laughs> I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. Yeah. You show that you have repented and you apologize for the wrongdoing. That's what brings reconciliation. Sometimes we are too quick to want to reconcile people. Time will not permit me today. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, 14, and 15, you read about Paul and Barnabas. God gave a word. Separate to me Paul and Barnabas for the work unto which I've called them. Then as they were going on the work, they took John Mark with them. The one that God has not called with them. And then it caused a rift. But when you go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul was at the departure lounge of life. He was about to die. What did he say to Timothy? He said, bring John Mark with you. It took time before Paul was reconciling to John Mark. John Mark wronged him. He forsook them. Reconciliation will take a bit of time. And it will take obvious repentance. And we know that you have apologized for what you have done. Some people want reconciliation. You don't want to apologize. You don't want to show any sense of repentance. I'm just saying this uh, uh, for somebody to understand that this Bible is loaded 
with sense for living. And we need to follow it if we want to make a good life. Thank you for listening. We hope you are truly blessed. Please feel free to email us at info at elevationng.org for all inquiries or to share any testimonies. You can also follow us on our social media channels at Elevation NG to have access to real-time updates on all broadcasts and special programs. Till we come your way again, keep making greatness common.